Hello, everybody. Thank you for showing up at what is really technically early for most of us. Um, and welcome to our first panel of the day, which is organizing across the North American political spectrum. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor David Plotke, who uh, has kindly agreed to come be the discussant and chair this panel for us. Uh, David, as you may know, is an Americanist in the politics department, working on political social movements, citizenship, and democratic theory. Um, so I guess without further ado, um, David, take it away. Thank you all for joining us. Well, we have um, three presenters. Um, we have three papers. Um, two of us are here so far. Uh, I think the papers are interesting. So um, since I'm, you've had me be chair, I will both be uh, good cop and worse cop uh, about uh, present, presenting times. Um, 15 minutes, is that sufficient? Sure. OK. And maybe by the time you're done, Comrade X will join us. <laughs> then we can proceed with his paper. If not, I'll just discuss yours. Okay. Why, why don't you go first? Okay. There's no strong reason for that. Um, okay, do you, okay, so Laura's got my, will be in charge of my slides. Um, so my paper is titled, Standing Athwart the Tea Party Yelling Stop, Gauging the Tea Party Through the National Review. Um, the paper actually was written last semester for David Pluck, he's a uh, class, so I appreciate him, uh, his feedback on the paper. Um, I apologize, give me just a moment. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I'm sorry, I just, uh, I'm, I'm looking for it now, of course I don't have it pulled up. Um, so, uh, the sort of start of my uh, paper is, is on this, uh, this text by Theta Scotch Pole and Vanessa Williamson. Um, it's kind of a, a definitive text for um, American Political Science on the Tea Party uh, that came out uh, at the beginning of this year, actually. Um, I'm actually not able to find my presentation, so I might just go over there with you, if that's okay. Do you want to just take a minute and look for it? Um, I don't want to, well, we've already taken, it's already 15 minutes in, so maybe it should be fine. Um, so, If I do present interview on here, is it going to, yeah, that's my fault. Okay, well this is fine. Um, so in the, in the account that they offer, uh, Scotch Pole and Williamson argue that the uh, analysis of the Tea Party up to the publication of this book has been incomplete. Um, the sort of dominant frames of the Tea Party are considered in one of two ways. The first is a kind of, through a grassroots uh, mobilization so this is the kind of image that you usually see of angry hordes of people, signs, flags, etc. Um, and so reporters and academics alike sort of focus on the grassroots activism of the Tea Party. Um, the second form, maybe you, yeah, maybe you can just advance them. Uh, the second is the kind of uh, astroturf argument that Paul Krugman offers in the New York Times um, that says that the grassroots activism and focusing on the grassroots fails to accomplish uh, an analysis of these uh, sort of elite organizations such as Freedom Works, um, Americans for Tax Reform, and Amer Americans for Prosperity that were uh, deeply involved in the success uh, of the Tea Party, the funding, um, the lobbying, the ways that they were able to sort of organize very quickly relied uh, chiefly on the resources offered by these organizations. Um, and their argument is that these, uh, that this sort of fails to grasp a third leg of um, the importance of the Tea Party, and that's the media. So here we have uh, Glenn Beck at the Restoring Honor Conference um, in 2010, and also in 2009 he had a 9-12 rally that uh, drew a couple hundred thousand people. Um, also as a pundit on Fox News, he was able to sort of leverage his position as a kind of newsmaker to create uh, what Scotch Paul and Williamson call an echo chamber um, about the Tea Party. So they were able to sort of 
dominate the narrative that then got picked up by other sympathetic conservative um, outlets. Uh, and then if we go to the next one, so the, the way that they prefer to think about the Tea Party is kind of a three-way, this is Scott Paul Williamson, a three-way kind of um, approach that takes into consideration the grassroots, the sort of media apparatus, most, you know, chiefly Fox News here, but also the other sort of uh, reverberations, and then the, um, the third leg being the sort of elite organizations, the lobbying groups. Uh, so for my paper, I wanted to focus on their... Um, this, this sort of bottom uh, third, the role of the media on uh, the success of the Tea Party. So I selected the National Review um, as a sort of case for analyzing the way that the Tea Party message impacted National Review and the way that National Review kind of impacted the Tea Party. To follow the logic that Scotch Paul and Williamson identify in uh, Fox News is reporting of the Tea Party and try to locate it in other media outlets. <clears throat> I've selected National Review because it's a sort of um, elite opinion journal. It's been around since uh, the mid-1950s. And uh, as you can see here, it's highly conservative, very critical of the president. Um, these are just a few of the covers. Um, and so the idea was then that, that if the Tea Party's message had some success, um, in the sort of conservative discourse that you'd be able to see that in the reporting of the, of the National Review. So the theory was that if the Tea Party's message of the importance of fiscal conservatism um, and a kind of rejection or maybe a turning away from, not a rejection, but a turning away from social issues and towards more fiscal conservatism, that you'd be able to see that in the National Review. Um, and, and also, I'll, I'll, that was my original effort was to see how uh, strict fiscal conservatism was picked up by National Review uh, toward to the sort of um, uh, replacing kind of more social issue oriented reporting. So we can go to the next one. This is William F. Buckley, the founder of National Review. This is the first issue. Um, I might just read a little bit here. Uh, he founded the National Review as a counterweight to the liberal bias that he found in um, magazines and journals. He he said that you know the New Deal couldn't have happened if it wasn't for like the nation and the New Republic, and so. Uh, the point of National Review was to stand athwart history yelling stop. That's um, a direct quote. He, he really he wanted to see uh, a sort of conservative counterweight to the, um, the sympathetic media that produced a kind of environment of uh, liberalism. Um, also, what's remarkable about Buckley is that he was the first sort of prominent figure to articulate a conservatism that was strong military defense and fiscal conservatism, which were sort of historically Republican Party platforms, but also bring in a, tradition, a traditional family sort of morality politics, um, which is like, uh, which I think we kind of forget sometimes how important that addition was, that it happened in the 1950s that Republicans began to articulate a kind of defense of family rhetoric that now is like a huge part of their platform. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me for that one. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, so it wasn't just Fox News that was talking about. Um, cons uh, it was talking about the Tea Party. This is a, a graph from Boykoff and uh, Leshefer's, uh article on the media's representation of the Tea Party. And you can see here that CNN actually had the most reportage um, over the time period that they analyzed, which is February 19, 2009 to November 31, 2010, um, which is also the sort of time period that I was looking at. So. Uh, Fox News is obviously second, but you can see that there's a general interest in media uh, on the Tea Party. The difference for Scotch Pone Williamson, however, is that uh, groups like CNN and MSNBC were doing a more sort of uh, transparent kind of reporting, whereas um, Fox News was, was doing this sort of echo chamber work, was actually producing new messages about the Tea Party that were then getting picked up by other um, conservative uh, media outlets. So the way that I did this uh, project was to look at um, the three issues prior to the 2008 presidential election and also the three issues prior to the 2010 midterms. Um, I selected these three issues because I reasoned that uh, election issues were more likely to have a kind of coherent political message like capital P politics specifically geared towards um, revving up the base. So I looked at uh, the 2008 
uh, election as a kind of control, because this was prior to Obama's uh, election and therefore prior to the Tea Party. And so I wanted to see what the reporting of, of social issues was in those three issues, and then compared to the three issues prior to 2010, hypothesizing that uh, the three issues in 2010 would see a reduction in the number of social issues reported on abortion, gay marriage. We also don't know what we mean by social issues, right? Um, and so this is what I found. Uh, this is the, so if I was better with graphs, I would do like a squiggly line here or something because there's no continuity. Um, there's a break. But these are the three uh, issues prior to 2008, and these are the three issues prior to 2010. Um, and so there's no sort of conclusive, uh, I mean, this particular issue had a, an entire section on abortion, and so that's why it mapped um, rather high. But in fact, when I sort of, without doing the coding that I did for these three, but when I sort of looked through other issues, I found that hovering around five or six articles devoted to social issues was pretty much the norm for the National Review, and this was true uh, across 2008, 2009, and 2010. So my ori original kind of... Um, question about uh, whether or not we would see a reduction in social issue reporting in the National, Repu uh, National Review through, you know, after the rise of the Tea Party wasn't exactly confirmed um, by my initial findings. And so then as I'm like doing the coding and looking for the, uh, you know, uh, prevalence of social issues or not, I start noticing that there's a, a big absence in reporting in the 2010 issues, and the absence is of the Tea Party itself. Um, so maybe we could go to the next slide. So this is, uh, so as I began to sort of look further, I, um, I noticed that the, t the, the magazine as a whole did not mention the Tea Party often, um, which I think is a really remarkable development. So the, the uh, graph on the top is my analysis of actual mentions of the Tea Party, and for this I did the entire two-year, I coded the entire two-year stretch from um, the beginning of the Tea Party in February 2009 through the end of 2010. And it's remarkable that the uh, mentions stay like relatively low, um, here it hovers around five. This is a national reporting on the Tea Party, um, and so I sort of followed this method that, that Boykoff and Lechefer use uh, to find how often the National Review is talking about the Tea Party. And in fact, um, you can see that the national organizations were talking uh, about uh, the Tea Party a lot more. Especially what's really interesting is that this period, you can see there's a spike here and another one here. Uh, this was the period of the um, healthcare town halls, that the Tea Party, the sort of initial Tea Party activism was really geared around uh, the sort of, you guys all remember all this, right? Like people crowding the, their legislators' um, offices and having these big, boisterous, disruptive meetings. Um, and so you can see that it had more interest in the sort of national media than it does uh, for the National Review. And, and then the spike obviously occurs at the election. And what's remarkable about the spike here for National Review versus this kind of more rounded um, uh, reporting is that this spike is actually the issue after the election. So that, uh, that it's, it's like the National Review isn't even, you know, doesn't even want to sort of uh, uh, claim the Tea Party until its electoral success can be demonstrated. Um, I think, uh, so I, I don't know, I think this is really interesting and it, it, it was not what I was expecting when I first started this project. I was really hoping to see that um, like Fox News, like Conservative Talk Radio, the National Review was kind of marching in lockstep with the uh, Tea Party message, with sort of supporting Tea Party activism, etc. Um, there's a couple of, I think there's a couple of explanations for this. Uh, the first is that the Tea Party was really founded, as I said, as a kind of um, ideological, sort of elite opinion making uh, arm that was. Um, really supposed to sort of be forwarding the national conversation, really trying to be at the front of a kind of conservative idea making. Um, and so therefore, grassroots activism doesn't necessarily uh, mesh well with a kind of, um, with a kind of elite opinion generated frame of, or you know, way of looking at 
uh, media. If we go to the next slide. Another one, this is a quote from Karl Rove's interview in Der Spiegel. Um, he says, if you look underneath the surface of the Tea Party movement, you will find that it's not sophisticated. It's not like these people have read economist Frederick uh, August von Hayek. Rather, uh, these are people who are deeply concerned about what they see happening to their country, particularly when it comes to spending, deficit, debt, and health care. Um, which is a kind of classic uh, argument about populism, that they're not um, sort of, it's not a reasoned kind of, they haven't read Hayek, they're not, uh, I, I think this, this phrase, uh, you'll find that it's not sophisticated, is extremely telling. Um, because for Rove, the problem with the Tea Party, uh, here he sort of, he sort of do, does both. He says that they're, you know, they're just angry people, but it's not sophisticated, he's kind of in and out. Uh, Rove also was very critical of Tea Party elections, like the election of Christine O'Donnell uh, in the Republican primary in Delaware to run for the Senate, because he said that you know now. I mean, he said on Fox News when they asked him about the O'Donnell election, he said you know we've just lost lost the Senate seat to Democrats. Um, he was really sort of critical of the development of Tea Party sentiment, uh, and so I think this question of sophistication is really why both sort of Rove and the National Review were uh, less than. Um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough line to walk, so I, I don't want to claim that they are uh, not supportive. So maybe my title is a little bit like, I need to rework the title for the paper. It just, it just like worked really well, I thought. But um, the, the claim isn't that they were sort of, uh, you know, against the Tea Party in any way, but that um, the activism that the Tea Party represented was not the sort of way that the National Review frames politics in general. And that their most sort of open-armed uh, appreciation and welcoming of the Tea Party occurred in the immediate issue after the 2010 midterm elections, once the Tea Party sort of demonstrated their, um, their chops, their sort of electoral potential. And I think for the conference theme of social movements, it, this project reminds us that uh, while we should be sort of attentive to the complexities of the movements that we study, I think that we should also be attentive to the complexities of um, the media that reports on those movements, the, uh, the you know, elite political organizations that serve as sort of financial support for these movements, and um, yeah, and so I'll stop there and then maybe ask, answer questions if they come up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, right here, happily. Uh, why don't you um, take it away? Sure. Um, so my name is Brian Carter, um, and my paper is about the 2012 movement. I want to be very clear that this is not an extended project that I've spent a considerable amount of time on. This is me kind of fleshing out ideas and hoping to get feedback um, in this format. So um, please pepper me with criticism because I want to kind of pursue this going forward. Um, but my, my paper is titled Privileged by Another Name, and it's a critical race theory critique of the 2012 movement. Um, in uh, 1974, uh, the music department of the University of South Carolina uh, began what, uh, became, what became to be known as the String Project, right? And this is where they send uh, undergraduate students who are music majors into inner city communities within South Carolina to teach children, you know, classical music and teach them how to play classical instruments. Now. You know, I'm not an urban geography kind of expert at all, but I think you have to have an actual city in order to have an inner city in South Carolina. Um, in 1990, I was a member of the 16th class. Um, so I'm seven years old, and I'm learning how to play the viola and violin and the cello. Um, and I wasn't really excited about it, but I got good at it. So even during my second year, I'm like all gung home. I'm practicing the hour a day, and I'm really into it, and I've memorized all the music. So we have chair auditions, right? And in these chair auditions, you kind of go into a room and it's like a blind audition. You don't know what you're playing, you don't know for whom, um, but your performance dictates where you're going to be within the orchestra in, in your particular <coughs> section. Um, as a typical eight-year-old, I don't have any of my music. I have no idea where it is, but I've memorized everything, right? So I go into the room and the guy says, hey, where's your sheet music? And I say, I have no idea, but if you tell me what you want me to hear, what you want to hear, I'll just start playing. So we go through four or five pieces in that way and I play all this music. And he says, dude, that's really great. Do you have everything memorized? I said, yeah, pretty much. He says, do you play anything else, right? So 1990 is also the year of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, <laughs> right? 
And I'm thinking, hell yeah, I'll play something else. I can play the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song. And I'm just like reeling it out on my viola. And I'm all excited about it. And I get about five or six bars in. And he says, no, 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 stop. I mean, do you know any other real music? Right? This is my first experience that I kind of remember of being an other, right? Where the thing that I so closely identified with, the thing that, I, that kind of made me who I am, right? Being an eight-year-old kid who loves Will Prince, oh, Will Prince, who loves Will Smith, who loves the Fresh Prince, and this kind of being central to my young identity being not good enough for the performance in front of this audience. Um, and when I saw the Coney 2012 video, I kind of felt the same frustration and I felt the same otherness, right? In my mind, I'm thinking, who the hell is Jason Russell to kind of define the political um, future of Ugandans, right? Um, so, I mean, I get all of you guys know that, you know, uh, in March of last year, um, well, in last March, that they released this kind of short documentary on YouTube and other social media sites that got nearly 90 million views very quickly, actually. Um, and their effort is to make Joseph Kony, who is a Central African warlord, famous, right? Um, and their contention is that by raising funds to support the humanitarian efforts in Uganda and increasing the awareness of what Kony has done, that they can bring him to justice um, and resolve an ongoing conflict. Um, I really don't want to get into the ideas of what was accurate about that depiction and kind of what was truthful about what they were saying. I really don't think it's important for what I'm focused on. I really want to kind of talk about 2012 as part of a larger um, kind of phenomenon, right? Where you have these organizations and you have these really engaged individuals who believe that just with ingenuity and these great ideas and dedication to what they perceive to be social justice, that they can go around and fix the problems that have been plaguing these communities that they have no actual attachment to, right? Um, and I want to use critical race theory to kind of to talk about it because I think it gives um, me an opportunity to kind of delve um, into a canon of, of literature that kind of addresses multiple areas, right? So it's about race, it's about the law, um, it's about politics, it's about political voice, and it kind of allows us to kind of think about um, these kind of movements in a moralistic way. Um, so I want to argue that these types of movements, these Coney 2012 types of movements, um, what they don't do is acknowledge the political voice of the communities that they're serving. Um, so what do Ugandans have to say about Kony and how does that matter? Um, they don't address the core reasons for the cultural and political challenges affecting these communities. Um, so for Central Africa, you might think Colton um, and the way that that's used. If you have a cell phone, an iPad, any kind of electronic device, you have <coughs> benefited from um, the chaos that's happening down there. They don't acknowledge the privilege of the interceding actors, right? So us as Americans, the way that we go down there, there's you know, a privilege that we have, right? And there are reasons that we're able to kind of live these lives that we have that Ugandans don't. Um, so specifically, because I'm using CRT, I want to talk about white privilege. And when I say white privilege, I'm not talking about crosses and sheets, right? Like, I, that, that's not the idea. But it's the idea of unearned advantages of being white in a racially stratified society, <coughs> excuse me, that is largely ignored by white individuals. <coughs> excuse me. So the fact that we're all here, right, and we have access to this expensive private education, you know, in lower Manhattan, and that a kid from Brownsville probably never will, um, is kind of this idea of white privilege. Um, and I also want to kind of address the, the kind of uh, the oppressive systems of governance that kind of repli that is replicated and supported by these kind of movements, right? So again, we're not necessarily overhauling or changing the way in which politics happens in these areas that we're kind of influencing. We're really just kind of re reinstituting the system that's already kind of there and is already oppressive to those persons in particular. Um, so I have two critiques and three kind of arguments, kind of sub-arguments arguments within those critiques. The first one is that the Coney 2012 movement represses the political voice of Ugandans, right? And it does it in two ways. It changes the government's primary constituency away from the Ugandan people and into, um, away from the Ugandan people, and more focuses on the um, international organizations and governments that are supplying their, you know, their GDP. So people who are supplying these billions and billions of dollars in aid to kind of prop the country up, become the main constituents of the elected leaders of Uganda versus um, the actual people who are elected into office. Um, and it distorts the political landscape of the average Ugandan, right? So what makes someone in Uganda think that the way that things are, the way they're supposed to be, right? Or what, how do they kind of perceive the way in which their world should operate versus how it actually is? Um, 
And the second critique is that the Coney, uh, excuse me, Coney Tony Tell re reproduces oppressive systems. And for that, I want to focus on white privilege and white supremacy. Um, so let's start with um, the changing of the government's primary constituency. Um, Dambisa Moyo is an economist um, who works primarily with African nations, and she is completely 100% against foreign aid. Um, she tells the story of, of, of a friend that, uh, a conversation she had with a friend where he says that Africa is to, to development where Mars is to NASA. Every year we spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing research, experiments, analysis into Mars, into Africa, but actually no one believes we will ever live on Mars, and the fundamental problem is that no one has faith that Africa will ever, ever develop. So this dependency of African governments on foreign aid, she says, leads to like this, this change of constituency, right? So if I'm a president of a poor African country, and I have to find a way to keep my economy going, do I tax my citizens who have absolutely nothing, or do I beg for aid? And knowing that I need the aid to keep my government going, what becomes my, um, my political motivations, right? Like how do I, do I shape my government? Do I shape it based upon what's happening in the field? or do I shape uh, my government based upon those who are supplying the aid? Um, and Moyo argues that the African citizens gain little benefit by um, in working to build political constituencies in their nation. She says, you are asking us Africans to go and elect our leaders, uh, but, it was, but what is the point of electing those leaders in a democratic process when they don't provide us with the goods and services that we need? Um, she says there's little benefit to participating in a democratic system where there are no measures of government accountability. Um, and, and kind of where Invisible Children operates in this is that they're, not that they're providing so much aid that they become this kind of player in Ugandan politics, but their insistence upon more U.S. intervention, right? So obviously the U.S. government already supplies money to countries across the world, um, but their model isn't necessarily for increased political agency for Ugandans and their um, ability to kind of form and restructure the government from the inside. They're saying that they need even in more additional outside assistance. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the military presence that's going to be that they're advocating for. Um, my second critique is that it distorts the political landscape um, of the Ugandans. And to kind of talk about this, I want to use um, some cognitive psychology research that Melissa Harris Perry kind of adapted to the social sciences. She talks about the crooked room. Is anyone familiar with this at all? Okay. So crooked room uh, research in psychology, it's psychology research, it's not social science research, so basic social science research, but it's, um, the experiment is this. If I were to take you um, and blindfold you and put you into a dark room, right, the room itself is angled, right, so everything's on an angle, the doors, the, the fixtures, the furniture, everything is angled, but the chair that I put you in allows you to swivel at any angle that you choose, right, so you're able to move side to side, up and down, wherever you need to do. And I put you in a room and I turn all the lights off and you're blind to the room and then I suddenly turn the lights on, right? And your job is to find the upright position, right? So you're supposed to figure out what is my 90 degree angle based upon the room that I'm in, right? And the research found that most people are field dependent, right? That they have to rely on what they see to kind of find out where they are. So many of the, uh, the participants were, you know, kind of found themselves in weird angles as far as 45 degrees over to the left or over to the right thinking that this room, right, is actually at this angle and I'm the one that's wrong. And most people aren't feeling independent, right? So most people can't just figure out, hey, the room's jacked up and this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm, I'm actually right. Um, what Melissa Harris Perry does is apply that to the social sciences and says that in our political and our cultural landscapes that we do the same thing. That in the way that we kind of, de that we determine what, um, what's happening politically and what's happening culturally, that we're field dependent and that we will adjust ourselves to the actual um, political and cultural landscapes of what's happening in the world versus realizing that, hey, my government is jacked up, right? It's, instead, of, instead, of, instead of anticipating that my government is supposed to, put this, is supposed to uh, supply certain services and certain goods to us as a people, um, I think that receiving aid from friendly you know, faces from abroad is kind of the way that things work, right? That's just how my life is supposed to be. Um, and I think that uh, Invisible Children's work kind of parallels this, right? Um, it's not focused, their work isn't focused on making the Ugandan government more accountable. 
Um, it doesn't suggest that there are rights to which the Ugandan people are entitled. It doesn't, excuse me, it doesn't suggest that the Ugandan, itself, the Ugandan government itself needs to be changed, but it insists that the American government Right, has to be more involved in the affairs of the Ugandan people. The 30-minute video mentions the word government 10 times. Only once does it refer to the Ugandan government. Every other mention, every other talk about governance is always about how the American government itself needs to be more involved in changing the lives of Ugandans. Um, and the language itself is very we-focused, right? Like, we hear you, you know, we understand, we hear your cries, we're going to help, we're going to end this war. Um, but it doesn't talk about you know, the Ugandans having their own agency, having their own ability to kind of fight these distortions. <coughs> and the distortion is double-sided, right? So it's not just a distortion for Ugandans, it's also a distortion for us, right? So the kind of the first thing you see when you see the video um, is a comparison of these, uh, the, the credible lies that we have and how social media connects us all and kind of the rights and privileges that we have in America. And then it's juxtaposed against this one kid, this, this poor kid, Jacob, right? And like how much his life sucks and He's a, a victim of the war, and he's lost family in the war. But that's not everybody in, in Uganda, right? Like, I'm sure that if you visited Kampala and were, had enough money that you probably could live a pretty normal life, something that would be comparative, that you could compare to living in the States. Um, but it just provides this very narrow picture of what being a Ugandan is, um, and then allows us to kind of build um, this idea of being an other, right? So there's us, all of us, right? Not it's not a race-based thing at all, but it's all of us, and look at these lives that we have, and then these people who clearly need our help because they aren't capable of building these better lives for themselves. Um, and that leads me to my second critique, which is that it reproduces a system of, um, a, a set of oppressive systems, and I want to talk about white supremacy. Um, the campaign is very centered on a theme of us versus them, right? Um, they cannot justify their presence and their interceding into Ugandan political affairs if, it does, if they don't strip Ugandans themselves of their own political agency, right? Um, and, and part of what, a, a huge part of what it does, it kind of ignores the real undergirding um, phenomena that are really the core challenges to you know, folks living in Uganda. So they don't talk about colonialism. They don't talk about fair trading practices. They don't talk about all these international things that make it really hard. Um, for African nations to rebuild themselves, <clears throat> but it's focused completely on intervention. Let's go and let's help. Let's get our government involved. Um, the contention that any individual can do this work, um, that it only takes determination to successfully reform a nation, that by making a warlord famous in the United States that he will be captured in a Congolese jungle, but little the complexity of the challenges and the efforts of those persons who have dedicated their lives to the success of Uganda. It does so in favor of what I call extracurricular activism. Activism where participants give the outward appearance of an engaged campaign, but where the true nature of the campaign is one with the little knowledge, is one where there is little knowledge of the root issues affecting the populations of interest, and where the target audience contributes to changing the circumstances of an unnamed other by participating active um, by participating in passive activities. Another example of this kind of campaign is the work of organizations like Children's International or Greenpeace that hires fundraisers to a wide crowded footpaths in major cities and raise funds to save the children or save the earth. One might also look at late night infomercials where after a sad serenade by Sarah McLaughlin and pictures of abused animals, someone suggests that a donation amounted to a cup of coffee will radically transform the life of some suffering child in a foreign nation. It is the idea that small, simple acts combined with a declaration of dedication to a cause will dramatically improve the dire circumstances of, uh, experienced by some other. Um, the othering of Ugandans is really central to this work, right? Um, again, like I said, you can't claim the right of responsibility to intervene if Ugandans have their own political agency. Um, and it's systemic of a, a, a set of, um, it's a systemic, a systemic pathology of unchecked privilege um, and the dilution of complex challenges is a replication of a racist system of white supremacy. Um, and this is an export of American um, injustice, right? Where, um, and I'm not arguing that the founders themselves are racist. That's not my contention at all. But I am arguing that um, uh, the nature of the declaration and the work and their work speaks volume. I'm sorry. I am arguing that um, their unchecked racial privilege, their effective silencing of the political voice of Ugandans, and their support of racially insensitive policies of international intervention are the products of an oppressive system of racial hegemony. Um, 
to kind of talk about that, I want to focus on the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a law professor at um, Columbia and UCLA. She talks about racism as a means of uh, not only dehumanizing people of color, but also privileging whites, um, and calls racism a consensus building hegemonic role. It says racism has a consensus uh, building hegemonic role, but they said by designating people of color as separate, visible others um, to be contrasted in every way with every other social group. Um, and when you think about the Coney 2012 video, again, you want to think about the way in which um, they depicted the lives of Ugandans, where they only gave this one picture of this one kid um, who has suffered under the regime of, um, of Joseph Coney, and not talked about the brighter, I'm um, sorry, the wider kind of political and cultural aspects of living in Uganda, um, and the way it kind of sets up a, a binary dynamic, right? That that's very familiar to us, like this uh, kind of us versus them. It's part of everything that we do, whether we're talking about sports, whether they're talking about politics, whether they're talking about whatever. It's always this kind of binary aspect to our work. And Crenshaw also talks about symbolic versus material oppression. Um, so when you think about symbolic oppression, think about the ways in which um, uh, we're oppressed, but it doesn't necessarily have uh, an immediate impact on how we live our lives, right? Um, so think about like Jim Crow. Think about um, the denial of access to professional and social organizations, right? Like, it sucks. Um, but the fact that I have, as long as I have a separate bathroom, it doesn't mean that I don't have a bathroom at all. Um, versus material subordination, which is more about the economics, poor housing, poor health care, crime and life expectancy. And it's not to say that, that um, I'm sorry, it's not to say that symbolic oppression doesn't lead to material suppression or that symbolic impression is any less um, is any less damaging than material. But it is to say that, you know, most of the reforms that we work on works to reform symbolic impression, right? To kind of take away this kind of face of racism, but it doesn't actually address the kind of undergoing um, uh, the kind of underlying um, challenges that are really leading to like disparities within our communities, right? So yes, I can go to the same schools as you, provided I can find a way to pay for it. Um, And I want to argue that removing Tony from Central Africa is really a symbolic gesture, right? Um, the lives of most Ugandans will not change whether or not that man is in power, partially because he's not even in Uganda, um, but also because his, there have been reforms and there has been work to kind of limit the, the, his ability to kind of wage the same kind of war that he has, and it's been that way for about seven years. Um, and even if he's gone, Ugandans is still overwhelmingly poor, right? There's still very little ability for Ugandans to, to trade um, internationally. Um, there's no education infrastructure, no travel <coughs> infrastructure. Um, there's no real economic infrastructure. There are a lot of other challenges and a lot of other ways that we can advocate, or that uh, Ugandans can advocate for themselves that would have a much larger impact on the way they live their lives. Invisible Children ignores, ignores all of this um, in favor of advocating for US military intervention. Um, and they do not kind of address the material oppression that's happening um, in Central Africa, in Central Africa generally, in Uganda specifically. Um, so yeah, that's my critique of the Coney 2012 and kind of where the project will be going in the future. So um, thank you. Um, um, No, I, I'm just going to, but he doesn't know if he's going to show up. Uh, his last email said he should, well, means it should be here shortly, but it's unclear. So. Um, well, why don't I just be him and then make my comment and leave back, because I don't think we could, um, we, we don't know. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Colin briefly. If Colin shows up to be Colin, that's fine. <laughs> um, he's probably better Colin than me and make some comments on that than the other two papers. And I'm going to try to link the paper, comments on the papers to, in each case, a, a broader issue of, of some kind. The um, Collins uh, paper is drawn from his dissertation research and is about uh, local politics in Philadelphia. And in particular, it is, uh, it is about the relationship between a, a punk subculture I, were these papers distributed? Has anybody seen the paper? Well, so I'm not, I'm going to be brief, but but get to the question because I don't want to use a lot of time to describe. And he may well show up and say more about his paper. Um, 
in Philadelphia, there a, was a fairly vigorous Occupy movement. Um, I don't think anything is being occupied now, but it still exists as a network. And there's also a, a sort of counterculture, I would call it, that's not his term, it's, maybe it's a generational difference, um, of, of punks. Of, and he sort of, it, 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 he describes in great detail the different families and tribes of punks in Philadelphia some of whom uh, sound exactly like the punks you remember if you're old enough from the early 1980s, like Johnny Rotten, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them sound like social workers and teachers in Philadelphia who like to get punky on the weekend and hang out, <laughs> where they have house parties, essentially. So, so his, I, his dissertation is about the, his ethnography, both of these uh, punk uh, communities, little communities, and we're talking about several hundred people uh, at most in that sub-community. And the Occupy movement, which at its peak was, you know, involved more than that, okay? So he has a, the empirical finding, I, I'm not sure he would present it this way, is that there's, the Occupy uh, movement was less a pull of attraction to the punk people than he had imagined. He, he thought there would just be a kind of natural convergence of, of attitude, interest, etc. But it turned out not to be so. Um, that's his other theme in the paper is that that you should um, pay. It. He has a critique of certain recent uh, forms of social movement uh, uh, analysis that he thinks abstract from accounts of of the political meaning of events. So we should look more at the political meaning of, of social movements as actors understand it. Um, I, it's an interesting paper. It's, it's appropriate in a way to present at a conference like this. It's research that's very much in its early stages. Uh, and I, I would say he hasn't really figured out if his focus is on his punk community or on Occupy in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, if if the latter, he's got an obvious problem, which is I'm not sure that that really exists as a movement anymore. It's something. There were people who were in it, but I'm not sure if you went to Philadelphia now and said, where's the Occupy movement, you would get anything more than the addresses and names of activists who were engaged. And we'll see around May 1st, there's something left, obviously. This is a big deal, a point, but I'm not sure how much is left. The punks are still there. Um, they live in households. They, they, it sounds kind of like uh, the awful communal households I lived in, uh, I shouldn't say awful, for a few years after graduation from uh, college. And these situations have their pros and cons. Um, um, actually, with one thing that they're great for, this is my only aside, they're great for uh, learning to cook if you live in one of those households, because typically, the way it works is that, that cooking responsibilities are rotated by mem through members of the house. Well, so if you got to cook one day a week only, then you better show something. Oh, it's not okay to bring you know mac and cheese four straight times on your assignment. So there's some good things about this household, and they seem quite diverse, quite lively. Um, the, the, there are a couple problems that uh, he's going to encounter that are partly methodological, and those are ones that I'll comment briefly. Um, one of them has to do with a tension between what the micro-level analysis of social movements and their related settings, the punks in Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera, and his desire to understand political purposes in political and social movements. Well, the problem is, the obvious problem if you think about it, that the broader political meanings don't necessarily arise in these micro-contexts. And, and a, a political purpose of a movement is something that arises at the, at the intersection between that movement and other social actors, or in the outward statements of people do not sit around within these subcultures talking all the time about the meaning of their activities. So that's a real, it's a real problem about how, whether this method is suited to his interest in exploring political meaning. I have to say there is nothing in the article about the political, me, political 
commitments, views, understandings of the people he's studying. I don't think that's because he forgot it. I think it's because it doesn't arise easily from an ethnographic approach. Now, I understood uh, one more thing to say about, that, about the ethnography thing. A lot of you are tempted by uh, ethnography. It is, it, it is a good thing to want to do. In, it's very much um, uh, an OK thing to do in sociology. It has been for decades, less so in political science. Um, one of the problems in political science is what I said before, of how to study politics at the micro level. You can study a political organization at the micro level, see what it does, how it raises money, etc., etc. But it's not clear, I won't repeat myself, that the political meaning of, and purpose of that arises through that study. There are other problems of ethnography that all of you who are interested in doing it face and that uh, Colin will have to reflect on. One is a, a terrible problem that ethnographers face, uh, which is um, a problem of selection. How do we know that the people you looked at, setting you looked at, stand for anything beside themselves? Anthropologists used to solve that in their old-fashioned way. They would pick an island at the extreme, Trobrian Islanders, a, a distant tribe, and that solves the selection problem because you're solving, you're studying the tribe, then or group. You can put that next to other people's studies, but there's no, there's a serious selection problem. Two is, how do we know? And I'm not urging quantitative analysis on everybody, but let me tell you. Let me compare the validity problem with um, another form of research that's popular around here: archival research. The claim is, if Camilla goes to do archival research on X, and she presents that <laughs> research later on, well, there's an implicit claim that if Stephanie went and did the same research, she could check if Camilla's report was correct. And of course, one would imagine there would be differences of balance, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, the idea is that it's, if not, if not literally replicable, Highly, highly, the validity easily crosses from one researcher to the next. So it's not like rerunning a regression analysis on the data, but another, nevertheless, and that's part of town. If you go do an ethnography of, I don't know, cop, you want to study cops in Brazil, and you study it, then we're, we're putting, it becomes a little tricky to know how to trust you. What, why should we trust you? Okay? Because you're smart because you're going to get a PhD, good for you. Well, but there's a lot of smart people, there's a lot of PhDs. So, so it's, it's a real problem of validity. The third one is, everybody knows this, anthropologists always go nuts about this, and they used to have a good phrase of it, that then they drop because of uh, political correctness and legitimacy. Legitimately so, perhaps. The problem of going native. You go to study some group. Marina goes, name some faraway group, Marina, that you might go study. Marina goes to study the Eskimos, an unlikely combination. Um, but, <laughs> which is not an ethnic claim, it's just I happen to know a few things about what Marina prefers, and they do not include things that are heavily featured in Eskimo living. Um, anyway, the, the problem is, it, in an in a ethnography of that kind, you identify with the group you're studying. Okay? You, you, start to give reasons why the practices that others might find weird actually make sense or are functional in that context, okay? And, and people can figure out how to deal with that. The problem with doing a political ethnography is the room for biasing, the room for selection bias and biased interpretation when you're studying and participating in a group you agree with seems to be uh, very, very, uh, if, if you read, and you can think about this by getting outside yourself uh, just a minute, if Chris were a uh, raving anti-abortion nut, and he did a, um, which I don't believe to be the case, if he did a political ethnography of the anti-abortion movement in Dallas, and reported to us about how great it is, and how it's misunderstood, and, said, and he said, then he concludes by saying, well, but trust me, in no way did my own political biases and preferences color my reading of this group. 
you know. Um, so that's the last problem. Last thing on Collins' paper. I I think I figured out the paper's interesting and worth reading if you put it if they put it up. Um, that the pro the reason that the punks are not so crazy about the Occupy movement partly has to do with the feature of the Occupy movement. At the the re, the Occupy movement for a variety of political and culture, re, cultural reasons declined to become programmatic. We're very familiar with that discussion. Okay. Well, if people are camped out in downtown Philadelphia in a non-programmatic expression of symbolic and cultural acts, the obvious problem is that the, the punk people already have a counterculture. Why do they need another counterculture? That, that, what would they get out of it? They're already in a rich cultural environment, so sure, it would be fun to hang out a little bit. A student in sociology, I don't know if anybody knows Scott Beck, do anyone? It's, it's doing a study that's actually somewhat similar in the sense that he's looking at the interaction between some uh, yoga people and Occupy. And the comp in New York, they set up a part, they came down, they wanted to be involved, provide um, services. And some of the same tensions arise. Who's the counterculture here? Who's providing the rich life? Who's providing meaning? Uh, and that gets into questions about um, the um, the role of program in a social movement, which go beyond my time. Uh, I will be relatively tough on Brian's paper, which um, I think he has uh, a, a, an American um, frame for a paper that is about something slightly different. And in order to do this paper, he, he in a revised version or an expanded version, he simply has to learn something about Uganda. You, 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 at the beginning of his paper, and I'm saying this in a friendly but tough way, you say, well, I'm not going to really talk about Uganda. But innumerable claims that you make depend on your reading of Uganda, which, which you don't have yet the capacity to make. Let me give a couple of examples. One is um, the, the claim that um, the Kony movement is depriving Ugandans of voice. I have no idea if that's true. Okay? I have no idea what Ugandans think about the Kony movement. I know that you can go online and check the Ugandan newspapers and see what they say about it, what the debate is. What you're saying might be true, might not be true. But you could, you, you can't, you, you make conclusions that might be true as though you knew about Uganda, but without doing work on Uganda. The second one is, basically, I, I, you're ultimately dismissive of Kony as an actual problem and treat him as symbolic, okay? Um, I don't know if that's true. My suspicion is no. My suspicion, uh, two things I know lend me, make me think it probably is wrong what you're saying. That is, the total number of people who have been abducted or killed by his organization is very large. And there's, Uganda is a pretty big country, actually. It's got about 35 million people. So, it, but it's a lot of people. And it's hard to believe that any country would regard somebody running around in the northern part of that country abducting kids and murdering a fair number of people as not a level one security problem. So when you say it's symbolic, what, that's partly true, but it's symbolic of a country that is unable to maintain its borders and its security. Whether that's symbolic or material, I don't know. But I suspect that uh, the, the decline of the um, uh, movement uh, doesn't settle that question. And it did relocate to the <coughs> Congo, but part of the, uh, let me skip the more African material. The, the, there's actually an interesting subject here in the paper that is a first cousin of his subject, but, but I think not, doesn't have nearly to do as much uh, with race as his account would suggest. Because of the internet, because uh, uh, northern countries have some money, 
because things get publicized. There are now a number of movements. This is not the only one. Um, the mo perhaps more successful and notable was the effort in Europe and the United States to focus attention on the treatment of people in Darfur. Um, okay? You're, you're familiar with that movement? Um, you know, a precursor, but one that's got new legs now, would be uh, the uh, movement in, um, to, to stop China's uh, treatment of people in Tibet. Uh, movements, um, I, I get 10 pieces of email every day on some version of some Central American or Latin American country oppressing native peoples in a horrific way, and they try to get a movement together. So all these things raise questions about, essentially, it's the old-fashioned charity debate, but brought into international politics, okay, with new claims about what's, you know, what, essentially, what's patronizing and what's liberating. And my guess, and this is why I want to keep getting back to Uganda, is there is no general answer to that. That one needs a fine-grained account of particular cases to know and do people want that assistance? Are you speaking for them? Are you depriving them of agency? Or are you giving them the possibility of creating uh, better political circumstances? So I think much of the material in the paper is quite interesting for your own work on race, essentially. But I think, uh, and racial politics. But I think the lack of, of investigation of Uganda and the lack of comparative attention to other, I call them sort of new internet social movements aimed at international pressure. Um, make the paper, that there's really then, uh, perhaps a better way to put it is, there's two papers floating around in here. One developed more on, on uh, racial politics with mainly an American focus, and two on these international configurations. Um, I won't say more about it. Uh, but I think they're both potentially good papers. The um, Williams paper I'm only going to be tough on because, well, I'm here, so why not? <laughs> but, but also I've praised it in various contexts, and, and uh, I, I don't, uh, with Colin I felt I had to bend over backwards to be nice, uh, especially given whatever kept him from coming. Howell's paper is, is, is very close to one publishable paper and one big project. And that is a hell of a lot. Okay? What it is now is a really first-rate map of the, the interaction between the National Review and the Tea Party. And that map is so infrequently done that kind of thing. But it's a contribution in itself. And the other great virtue of it is, uh, and I love this when people do some research and they're actually surprised that what they, that's the great thing about a hypothesis. It could be wrong and then you'd learn something and reformulate your views. So he did. But the, I'd say the task for him is to try to figure out what his argument about this interaction is in this case. What is he trying to, in two levels. One is, how do the causal arrows work between the Tea Party and the National Review? Who's driving what? Is anybody driving anything? Okay. Two is, um, well, I'll just leave it there. To work, to work that out, probably what he should also do is not run it forward through 2012, but probably take <coughs> one other right-wing uh, opinion journal and see if he gets a similar result. It's a weekly standard would be the other one. But I say, having done that, those two things, which are relative, one, both difficult, but, but neither uh, require blowing up his paper, he's got uh, probably a publishable article somewhere. The broader issue this raises is um, about how we think, or there's several issues that it raises, but one of them is a whole cluster of issues about the shape of of publics in, in mass politics. And wh what's interesting about this is that he giving us, um, I think it's true, everybody in the room, when you think about media and the Tea Party, you thought about Fox News, okay? And you leave aside this world, this very important world of, uh, I guess you'd call them elite opinion journals left, right, and center, that seem to play a very important role across the political spectrum. 
I mean, I know, I don't, I can't be more obsessive than, I don't know you, but I, I, re I read something, every, every week I read something, I get 10 bulletins from the nation, I read half of them. I get, I subscribe to the New Republic, I read some of that. I, Weekly Standard, I read some of that. New York Review of Books, I read some of that. I don't, I, yes, I am weird in uh, certain respects, but I, that isn't one of them. I think that people who are in this kind of the politically active world are in these. And what it's really going to complicate, I, I don't want to, um, I I'm, uh, think we're still indebted to, to uh, Habermas, but we'll go back to the 50s and 60s to relook at prior conceptions of what public opinion is like in, in mass politics, which tended to move toward a very simplistic conception of tiny elites on one hand and a uh, fragmented, manipulable, disorganized uh, mass on the other hand. And that, you know, we can't blame the Germans who started that line of thinking for that particular angle that was their experience in, in Germany. But we see from this account and many other that public opinion is, is much more, um, it's, it's not so much what, what, it's not what Habermas imagined, obviously, nor is it what, what Nancy Fraser imagined with the idea of counterpublics as relatively segmented forms of interaction. But there seem to be many more layers of political action and interaction. And, and as a broader, pro I'm not telling them what to do, but, but of course I am. Uh, somewhere in his intellectual work, later on to take up the relationship between this elite opinion world and mass publics would be a, a very useful project because the last thing to say about this is big hypothesis was that uh, with the internet and everything all this stuff was going to go away, right? So instead something more complicated happened which is um, newspapers have been beat to hell, right? That's the story daily newspapers, serious daily newspapers, but apparently, if you want to say elite, but, but fairly serious mass journals of public opinion, far from disappearing, have found ways to reinvent themselves and become uh, uh, extremely vibrant. So that's very interesting. So that I've gone over, but uh, I had to, uh, I had a lot to say about the papers, and I had to be calling for a minute, so. Do you want to respond to you? Sure, either of you. Did you want to start on that? Um, I can't, that's a behind. I, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, let's have brief responses by e each of you now, then questions, and questions directed you, to you, you can come and we'll mainly shut up. So just say a couple things. Um, I do think that the I'm not quite sure what the opinion journal. I mean, I'm I'm actually less interested in opinion journal and like public opinion writ large than the relationship in this paper between elite opinion and uh, those that presumably would share that elite opinion. So it's it's less about um, does National Review sort of set the tone on the way that conservatives are going to view uh, the Tea Party and more like why the Tea Party isn't, why they're not in dialogue with each other more. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a question of public opinion or sort of inside, like sort of politically sympathetic um, fellow travelers, but um, I am curious about the relationship between elite opinion and movements versus elite opinion and a kind of general public opinion. Okay. So I'm not, I, yeah, I yeah. have a lot to respond, I have a response, but I don't want to, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, I disagree with the idea of not framing this within an American context. And the only reason, I, well, one of the reasons I say that is because um, the movement isn't directed towards understanding the movement isn't one that's directed towards the Ugandan people, right? Like, this is an American, a Western phenomenon, 
right? So this is something that we've all kind of gravitated to and that's been exposed to us. Um, and I think that within that context, it's okay to take an American racial frame and apply it to that because that's the way that the founders are gonna be, that the founders of the movement are kind of operating. They're not operating in some sort of international understanding um, or communication of what happens you know, in Uganda. When they're communicating to us, they're doing it in a frame that is really representative of traditional um, frames of, of, of racial kind of attitudes, right? They're not, the attitudes, in, in the same way that the 2012 movement kind of talks about Uganda is the same way that um, the Gates Foundation would talk about Newark or Facebook would talk about Newark, right? Like it's that same kind of aspect of there's a <coughs> few that can determine and understand um, the politics of, uh, an, uh, an, uh, of an oppressed other. Um, and in that way, I think it takes on kind of a traditional frame. I don't think it's articulated well in the book at all. I don't, because I haven't done the work yet. Um, but I think you can take an American racial frame and then apply it to this work with the understanding that, you know, the, the outreach is, is not to Ugandans. And I think you can measure the absence of political voice of Ugandans within um, this context by measuring how much of it is actually present and how diverse it is within the media that's coming into an American household. So the idea is that by looking at this video, I can learn about a situation that's happening in a distant world and get a, a holistic picture of, um, of the landscape of, of the challenges that they're facing. And I'm saying that you cannot. Um, I think you're right in that it takes work in, in trying to, in having to understand what, um, and having to understand exactly what's happening in Uganda and that, that work needs to be done. But I still think you can take an, an American racial frame and apply it to the work that's, be, that's being done by 2012, only because it replicates the work being done by other kind of large nonprofit groups and kind of within the frame of a nonprofit industrial complex. Um. Um, well, I could go on and on about both comments, but uh, I've talked for a while and let's get, I'll, I'll maybe, I will reply, but later I'll get, let's get questions first. Uh, I know some names, Marina, and you, and Kevin. Yeah, my question is to Carl and sort of builds a little bit, I think, on David's comments. Um, I really like how you framed your project in the beginning as, uh, as Scotch Poles, uh, sort of third leg, the role of the media. And that sort of, you, you didn't really give me a, a conclusive view of what is the role of the media <coughs> in this process. And um, the other thing that I liked in the initial framing was that idea of the back and forth between, um, or the hypothetical back and forth between um, the Tea Party and the journal. So uh, based on your findings, would you say that there is no uh, possibility for the movement informing the content of the journal and the content of the journal informing uh, the work of the movement? And, you know, how how would that evolve and develop, or what do you think? How do you find more for that to develop? Yeah, I um, I in the in the sort of original like nice presentation, I do come back to the Scotch Pole Williamson argument because I do think that ultimately one of the sort of benefits of the project is a uh, expansion of what they're willing to consider when they say that the media is the third leg of the movement, and it's less as it's less refuting their claim that the media was, you know, obviously the media played a huge role in the proliferation of the Tea Party, but um, it's to say instead that that is as complex of a relationship as the movement itself. And so I think, so I sort of said at the end, and I think that it's important that um, in some ways we, are, we allow a kind of complexity in social movements that we don't allow for the kind of um, constellation of other social forces that they're in conversation with. Um, and the second question about the sort of back and forth between the Tea Party and National Review, I think uh, for the particular sort of structure of the National Review, I don't see them being sympathetic to any kind of populist conservative uprising just because of its uh, tradition of being this kind of well-reasoned. A great example is in 2008 um, in the reporting of the uh, 
in the, in the National Review's take on things like Dodd-Frank and other uh, pieces of legislation that were meant to sort of um, stem the economic collapse. The National Review is very supportive of some of these efforts. Things that in two years would become sort of anathema for the Tea Party. And so, and, and there's a great article that I mentioned, and I didn't get to it in the presentation, but there's a great article that's, you know, in 2008 says, you know, uh, it's, it's about Ron Paul saying, you know, if good, it's a really good thing that John McCain won the election, because imagine if Ron Paul, with all the, quote, kook baggage that he comes with, <coughs> getting into the Republican, you know, being the Republican nominee. And so you can see there that they're very, uh, the magazine's very um, nervous about a kind of libertarian, sort of no government uh, intervention in the economy kind of uh, project. So I, I think that um, they would be hesitant to get involved with any kind of social movement in that way. I don't think this is unique to the Tea Party. Wait, what? I've been caught, I should apologize, because I know half the people in the room and I've been using I, I names. Think, uh, which is not friendly. So I think I'm the only one who doesn't is not affiliated with the school here. So well, say your name is all. My I'm name is um, I'm a grad student at Boston University. I'm on a panel later this afternoon. My question was to Howell about. Um, I'm just curious when you coded your mentions. Um, do you differentiate between like whether it's you know a, a, a ten-page in-depth expose versus a news update right. blur versus like just it's a good question. I uh, no, it, I mean, which is a problem. I realize I coded articles for whether or not they mentioned the Tea Party. So some articles were, especially after the election, were explicitly about the success of the Tea Party. Others in the National Review, there's a section at the beginning called the Week, and it has all of it just blurbs, and I included those um, in the analysis, which has problems, but uh, because the paper is the second half of the paper, not the social issues question, but the question of reporting on the Tea Party was about how often the magazine regards the Tea Party. I was less worried about the nuance of that reporting and more just like getting a feel for... And would you, would you count something that it is very clearly about the, the Tea Party, uh, like let's say like a, a biography of a key right. personality, but it doesn't mention the words Tea Party or Tea Party Express or... Did. No. I mean, I understand the problems with that too, but this was really about the movement. I mean, like the Ron Paul is a good example. Yeah. Obviously, Ron Paul is kind of in the background of a lot of Tea Party activism, but unless, unless the magazine is going to make the effort to include the movement, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't okay. count it. But that's, a, that's, I guess, something for today. Kevin. Cool. Um, so first, congratulations that you're almost um, near the I don't have anything to say about it, but congratulations, because I remember when we sat in Diva Woodley's class, um, and we were just, we were thinking about, is a Tea Party a movement? Is it more of a variant of just um, status, anxious, angry folks that will move the Republican base further right? Or is it something more complex? So um, this is nice to see that this idea is um, really taking traction. So I'm happy to see that. Um, my questions are for Brian. Um, so I, I love the fact that you've decided to take on something so um, new that didn't, didn't really allow you, I guess, as much time to um, investigate it as fully as you would like to have done so. Um, so I'm interested in a lot of things, but I guess two things that jump out um, for me. I wondered if a concern of yours, if, or if you had looked at any of the literature around um, transnational social um, movements and sort of transnational activist networks, and if, if in fact that played a concern for you. For example, if we look at Darfur, there were examples of networks on the ground there, even if, even if, even if the story is sort of mythologized that it's you know, American Europe, but there were um, networks there on the ground that were already trying to address issues, and so it became more of a trans-national um, movement in that regard. So I wonder if you had looked at that, and if, and perhaps you didn't see any of that in a movement like, in how would we define movements, um, whichever way we're looking at that. If you didn't see any of that domestically, and that's why there's this, there's this a part of this that feels wrong to you, to you, to loosely speaking. Um, and then, and then the second thing is that. So you use critical race theory, which is um, which is obviously very interesting. Kim Crenshaw's work, I know her work um, as well, and, and because she she did, she sort of spearheaded a lot of stuff around looking at um, racism in education and testing. So so she's she's interesting for a number of reasons. But are you is your hope to eventually look at um, how this how this um, what happens on a legislative um, way at the end of the social movement? What happens in terms of laws that are made? The effect that the social movement has on 
um, how the politics sort of reorganizes itself in terms of what made you think to go down the path of critical race theory, which is often embedded with the, with the concept of looking at the law. So those are like my two things that were most interesting. Um, regarding transnational social movements, um, kind of yes and no. Like it's something I, I, I want to peek at a little bit further, but I really want to understand Coney 2012 as an American phenomenon, right? Like for me, it's not, it's not, and I'm speaking specifically about the first video, not the work on the ground, and not um, kind of how it relates to other works, but just the way in which they presented their work to um, their American audience, right? To me, that's an American racial phenomenon. And that's the way I really wanted to kind of take my initial stab at it. And I imagine as the, as, as the project progresses that, you know, it, it'll expand into more social movements work. Um, but no, I wanted to take a stab at it that was purely about um, um, kind of disseminating the way in which, in which racial attitudes play into how they <coughs> to frame what they're doing. Um, so, no, but yes. So is it not a movement in some ways because of the way it was constructed? I think it's absolutely a movement. I think okay. anytime you get 82 million page views on the website for people to sit down and watch 30 minutes of anything, it's the start of something, right? Like that's people motivating and, and, and acting around something. And I also think the way in which they've been able to engage um, the broader community, right, is kind of reminiscent of it, being, of, it, of it becoming a movement, right? So when Bono, Oprah, and all these other people start saying, yeah, get involved in this, donate money, buy these special little activism packs, they're going to make you some super activists. To me, that's, that is representative of the movement. Um, but I guess initially, I, I really wanted to understand um, just the kind of the actual, just the framing of the, of the, of, of the video itself, but just the framing of, the, of their arguments, right? Just kind of like, how is this similar to um, other instances where um, people of color have been otherized in such a way that um, uh, that their needs and their voice is kind of kind of secondary to to uh, uh, of the work of some dominant blah 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 blah. Um, but yeah, again, as it progresses, I imagine. Because Diva won't let me not do it. You know, it involved in the social movements work. Um, <laughs> um, regarding um, my use of critical race theory, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about that, right? Because it, eventually there has to be an ask. So much of the work was around, um, um, or so much of the framing was around the U.S. needs to get involved, right? So you see a lot of images of them walking around Congress and talking to politicians and, and encouraging people to, you know, write their legislators. Um, so eventually, you know, there has to be some sort of legislative act. Um, so yeah, it's kind of in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about it. Like eventually there's going to have to be some kind of movement. Like someone's going to have to comment about it. Um, and if it goes far enough, you know, someone's going to have to at least produce some legislation. Maybe some it gets off the committee or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but honestly, I, I wanted to use CRT, CRT just because I thought it was an interesting kind of canon of literature to kind of do a broad kind of spectrum about it, and it, it because it's not really well formed, that it kind of gives me the opportunity to kind of um, to talk about the race, the politics of race, and, and activism and voice um, in an interesting way. Um, so I want to take an initial stab at it. So, but yeah, let's get one or two more questions. So questions for both of you. Um, how? <laughs> I wonder, I haven't followed the National Review coverage as much, but I've followed sort of Tea Party Nation and other sort of online both blogs and sort of newsletters. And I suspect that part of the tension between the two is that if you follow sort of the Tea Party newsletters and email listservs and blogs, they're far more vitriolic than anything you'll find in the National Review. And so I wonder if this sort of not only the sort of National Review um, sort of anti-populist message, but also uh, a fear of um, being called out yeah. for kind of the white xenophobic racist that they really are. They can control that message in the National Review. They can't control that through the Tea Party. And so there's a danger from maybe from the National Review side of um, bringing too much of the Tea Party in because once that floodgate is open, they've effectively lost control of their own sort of message. So I wonder if that might be what sort of account for part of the discrepancy between uh, sort of popular Tea Party messaging versus sort of the official party through the National Review messaging um, of that. And then also kind of going to your question about methodology. I mean, from my own experience doing content analysis and discourse, the two things I would suggest doing 
is if you go back and look at some of this, look specifically at the length of the articles, um, the people that are being um, quoted in them, and their actual kind of favorable or unfavorable representation of the Tea Party, and see if there turns to be kind of a correlation. Long <laughs> articles tend to be favorable, short articles tend to be more skeptical. Because I think, I mean, in some of my own research, one of the things I found was that there actually are certain trends that are only visible when you start to kind of disaggregate internal to the stories and then across you know, a bigger area. So something to think about uh, in terms of that. And for Brian, I'm wondering if you've looked at the way that um, kind of the critique of the Coney movements has tried to articulate uh, either an anti-racist or kind of a critique of white supremacy within sort of American activist circles or within kind of larger public discourse? Because I know just kind of from a surface view that there's been a lot of criticism of the Coney video of the campaign, um, maybe with a kind of uh, quasi-imperial kind of critique, but I'm not sure if there's been kind of an attempt to do a structural analysis of how this is operating within kind of a white supremacist framework or how it's sort of perpetuating that precisely because it's totally um, not sensitive to those critiques at all. And so I'm wondering if, in your research, if you've come across an attempt to start to articulate a more kind of systematic critique of the Coney campaign within the framework of white supremacist sort of discourses, critical white studies, critical race theory, or if it's just been kind of pieces here and there. So like, do you see a, a more coherent critique coming out that you're trying to sort of contribute to, or do you feel like there's a total gap and that's why you're trying to intervene in that? Yeah, I, I, I think that the the vitriol stuff is totally, I think that's totally part of it. I think a great example is this guy that they let go like a week ago who wrote this like awful blog post about, you know, sh linking to scientific articles about why uh, whites should like stay away from blacks for, you know, a variety. He offers like something like 20 point uh, reasons. And they let him go almost immediately. And I think part of it is because there was a such public outcry, but also part of it is because the National Review poises itself as this kind of reasoned, rational, sort of, I mean, it's sort of old school Republican in that way. Um, and I think the methods thing is, is duly noted. I think that, that would probably be a helpful way to get at this question about full length articles versus like, you know, they sort of blur to the beginning. Um, so whether or not there's, a, there's been any structural analysis, it's, it's just way too new for that. Um, and I personally haven't seen it. I've seen a lot of commentary around it, um, but even that's been buried, right? So I think there's an, an idea that bringing attention to this is probably a good thing, um, but there's been a critique about, I've seen critiques about the way in which you know it's been done. Um, and I think a lot of the reason that I wanted to talk a little bit about political voice, or I want to talk a lot about political voice, is, is that I think people recognize that um, there's a lot of, in the initial video, again, I'm focusing on the initial 30 minutes, um, there's a lot of Jason Russell in it, and, and not a lot of uh, um, even American activists, you know, who have been doing that kind of work long term, talking about the structural challenges that are happening in Uganda. Um, I imagine that people are going to stop start hopping on it, you know, kind of long term. But I think it's part of it, it's, it's really tragic that the San Diego incident happened because I really wanted to kind of see it played out, right? So I, I think that a lot of this is going to get stifled behind that kind of weird controversy. Um, but no, I haven't. I have. I've seen a lot of critiques, but I've seen less of a kind of systemic, kind of rational approach to it. Not really. So um, I. We have another panel starting at 12:15. Uh, uh, out of respect to those people, I'm going to make a couple brief. Sorry, I'm going to make a couple brief comments, and we'll stop. And be on schedule. Being on schedule is a, is a good thing. Um, one about uh, Howell. I, I think part of what happened is with his project is that he discovered the right was more complicated than he actually expected. And that, that sounds a little condescending. But I, what, I, what I mean by that is, one way to think about the National Review is, the National Review has become the new republic. That is, the, the, that is the National Review used to be fire breathing and, and used to be pretty vitriolic. But they won a one. They, they had their buddy Reagan in office forever. Then uh, uh, son Bush, you know, Papa Bush, I guess, and then son Bush. So they're part of whatever 
quote, establishment, you could imagine, they become much more temperate and they want to be in any conversation and be responsible guys. So they, they, everything you said is true, but I think you want to temper the, you want, want to add to this some, sometimes the weekly standard is just like them, maybe you're looking for something else, but it's definitely a function of the kind of journal they become. And you, I'm not, I guess what you're looking for is uh, the right-wing equivalent of the nation, or even maybe a little bit rowdier, where, where they're more clearly in and out of the circles of power, where the nation wants, um, the nation is secretly terribly jealous of the New Republic because Obama reads the New Republic and not them as much. But they also want to be outside. They want to be outside and to take shots, okay? Now, so I, I think that's work to be done. I'll, I'll end on a friendly but, but challenging note about, the, about Brian's enterprise. One, one approach to all this it would be to say that to some large extent, this is, so far as this is about Uganda, this is changing the subject. That the International Criminal Court had, and this is in the video, had as its first, one of its first indictments was Joseph Kony, 2001, 2002. So it's, it seems to me that, that imagining that what we need to say about Uganda is whether we're in danger of imposing American racial biases on this, um, on this project is, the minute, the minute is not as important as figuring out what to do about Joseph Kony. I'm not sure that's right, but I think it probably is. And I think there's no basis for deciding that, that because if, if the premise of your of your argument, which you don't really draw out, is that he's just basically not very significant, and that be, and he's half out of Uganda, and so therefore this is it, is you go past that to say this is just a symbolic thing. Okay, he doesn't really matter. Sure, he's a bad guy, but there's lots of bad guys. That could be right. I don't know, but if if it's if it's wrong and he really is a war criminal and a mass murderer, then, then what you say about these aid efforts is quite different. The starting point would be, yes, they are paternalist, they even are tinged with racism, they are, are not what we would like, but look, in order to get rid of bad guys, you're gonna to have to make all kinds of compromises. And to make that judgment, right, you actually have to know more about Uganda. So, um, let me say, uh, in conclusion, that um, the session is over. That's a conclusion. <laughs> but it's very good, and, I, and I'm trying to, uh, I would say, I appreciate the opportunity to make these comments, and I appreciate the opportunity, I actually, uh, it's a good opportunity for the students to organize this because it allows professors to engage critically, not with students as, as colleagues and say what you think, and. It will be okay, and often in class, and in writing comments on papers, uh, professors feel more constrained. Okay, so it's good to go after you. Two. <laughs> a privilege and a pleasure, and thanks to everyone for uh, joining us.